Yo, what's up guys, welcome back to another reaction and today we're watching a video um, by Real Life Law and it's how one photo from space explains all of history. And yeah, I like this channel a lot. I don't know what to expect from this video to be honest. I mean, it's, I guess the whole video is, like it says in the title, going to be about one picture. But I hope we're not just stuck on the, sta the same screen the whole video because that would be pretty boring. But yeah, that probably won't be the case. My chair is so squeaky, man. I'm updating my setup over the next, I guess, month because I'm going to be away for like three weeks pretty much. So I'm going to have to try and get videos it done in, done in advance. But when I'm back, I'm trying to get a new chair, my background sorted, like LED lights, stuff in the background. Maybe just general things like that. So you'll probably notice a change. But for now, you're going to have to deal with the squeaking and all this kind of stuff. So I apologize. But I'm going to get into this video. It's a long one as well. So yeah, hopefully it's a good one. And let's just check this out. This video was made possible by Curiosity. What is the quality on? Why is it automatically on 480? Is it because my Wi-Fi is bad? This video is no made idea. possible by Curiosity Stream no Nebula. Watch another full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that explains the entire course of the Battle of Aleppo during the Syrian Civil War, which you can access by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal for Getting his bread, you love to see it. You've probably seen a map of the world before that looks a lot like this. A map of the world's yeah. 195 mostly recognized countries. These maps show the arbitrary lines created by humans over the centuries that divide us. They show the boundaries of nations and the locations of cities, and over the past several decades, this map has rarely changed. The last time that it formally did so was more than a decade ago in July of 2011, when South Sudan was born as the world's most recent country. Every political map of the world produced in the decades since that date has largely largely remain static and unchanged. And as a result, if these are the only kinds of maps that you've ever been looking at, you would have failed to notice the true, enormous, and unprecedented rate of changes that have been taking place all across the globe over the past 10 years. And in order to see that change more clearly, you've got to switch these to a- These pictures always baffle me, man. Like, I don't know, I do a lot of videos reacting to like world maps and like, just maps different types of maps and there was one where it was internet access and Europe was crazy and it does obviously make sense because Europe is probably the most lit up in the small area it's the most lit up but like god damn like here why is there so much light here like this is what Amsterdam this is the Netherlands and Belgium or Belgium and then the Netherlands why is it so lit up here because they're quite small countries I guess it's just a lot of nearby towns and stuff but yeah you obviously got the US I just love maps, I'm not going to lie. I would assume, though, I'd always assume that like, places like India and China, they'd be more lit up, but maybe because it's so sparse, you know, it's all like focused on one area, like bigger cities. Maybe it's just that's how it is, but yeah, it's interesting. And also, maybe it's not to do with cities then, because why is it so lit up here in Australia? I don't know, man. <laughs> Different map showing our planet at night. This is the Black Marble a beautiful map created by researchers at NASA using thousands of separate composite images that have all been combined into a single whole, taken from a satellite specifically designed to sense the world for man-made lights. Look at Europe, man. Nothing tells us more about the spread of- Oh my god, look at it. all along the river. This is Egypt. This is Egypt. I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, I'm going to sound like an idiot. Is this he- I'm going to say this is the, the Nile. The Nile's in the... Oh, God, I should know this. Well, it's along this river. And I'm pretty sure this is Cairo, and it just comes along here. I, I think... If humanity across know. the planet, then the patterns made by the glittering lights of our cities. And if you know where the right places are to look, this map can pretty much tell you all in just a single image the entire history and story of mankind. Let's begin okay. by looking at the real shapes and patterns of where people within countries live. Like here in Afghanistan, on a political map, Afghanistan has a very unique and complex looking shape. Wait, why is my... Alright, I'm gonna have to do something quickly. I'm still gonna be recording, but for some reason... My... I'm just gonna come back. It's so laggy, it always does this, bro. My camera's just ass. I brought a good camera and I can't even connect it to my PC. Ah. Oh. All right, is this good now? If he wants to load. That's a lot better. I don't know why it does that, man. Eight. But viewed on the map of lights at night, the true and simpler pattern of where Afghanistan's people live is revealed. In reality, Afghanistan's 32 million people live largely in a... 
this is 32 million people and it's this unlit what a gigantic ring with a single circular highway connecting most of the country's major cities and population centers all together this is largely because in the center of this ring are some of the tallest mountains found anywhere on the planet with some of the peaks rising to as high as 24,000 feet above sea level the interior is just too harsh of an environment for large-scale cities to be built on and thus the ring around them is where most afghans actually call home Strangely, the most comparable pattern of civilization to Afghanistan's ring of people can be found across the world over the Atlantic on Iceland. Similar to Afghanistan, the center of Iceland is full of highlands and harsh, cold, rugged terrain that isn't ideal for founding large-scale settlements on. Meanwhile, the island's coast has warmer temperatures and provides easy- I mean, it is. This island is just made from volcanoes, no? Your access to fishing and trade. And so, I as think. a result, Iceland's 366,000 people live largely in a ring around the island's interior along the coast. And about half of them live in the bright, glowing dot of the capital city, Reykjavik. Let's now take a look at another fascinating population pattern by traveling across the world again to the South American continent and focusing here over central Argentina. During the daytime, you'd barely notice any signs of human settlements here at all and might even think well, that you're looking at- this is this is the Andes, no? This is like Chile. I don't know if they also come into Argentina, I assume they will. I guess this is what you're gonna say, but- is it the Andes Mountains? I think it is. The daytime, you'd barely notice any signs of human settlements here at all, and might even think that you're looking at an abandoned part of the world. But flip the mm. switch to night, and the story looks very different indeed. Now, you'll notice rows and so, rows there, of nearly probably. perfectly spaced dots of light that betray the presence of precisely planned and organized human settlements. These dots are each a town, and they appear roughly every 30 to 50 kilometers apart from each other because they're all found across railroads, and they all grew up as railway stations. If you oh, contrast wow. the map of the area at night with this map of the Argentinian railroad network from the beginning of the 20th century, you can see how this pattern viewed from space became the way that it is today. Over in That's Russia, so a similar pattern can be viewed by the continuous chain of lights spanning- So dark, just dim. I guess Siberia, just, you just got Russia. It's just like uninhabitable, right? But there's still people that live in these areas. Like, uh, look, here, I don't know why I'm pointing with my finger. You can't see that. Here, here, and then here. I like, imagine the conditions. I can't even explain. I can't even, I don't know how it would be. There's probably some crazy ass people who probably live in these islands here. Maybe not. Maybe it would just be too cold. But you know what? I wouldn't be surprised. From Moscow, across honest. thousands of kilometers to the east through Asia, these sparkling lights of Russian civilization across Eurasia trace the Trans-Siberian Railway, the longest railway line in the world that connects Moscow in the west with Vladivostok in the east over a distance of more than 9,000 kilometers. And in between the two cities, the vast railway system connects hundreds of Russian towns across Eurasia that are easily spotted in the darkness. The initial railway was constructed and finished during the Tsarist times in 1916, and has been almost continuously mm. expanded upon from there ever since. Today, the rails extend from Russia into Mongolia, China, and North Korea, and later on this century, there what? are even plans to connect Tokyo and Japan to the network via a What the hell? All the way through Russia, and it goes into different countries, and they're gonna- how are they gonna connect it to, to Tokyo? I guess through here, down here, but that'd be- God, imagine the money that would cost. Series of bridges from Honshu to Hokkaido, from Hokkaido to Sakhalin, and from Sakhalin to the Asian mainland. One of the most fascinating areas of the world to focus over at night is Australia. Of course, the lights of Australian civilization are small for such a massive area of land, yeah. relegated almost entirely to the more habitable and Christ. easier to live on East Coast. The city of Perth, seen right here in the West, is the most isolated major city of over 2 million people anywhere in the world. And it's Damn. so much easier to see how that's the case on this map. The nearest other significant city with a population of more than 100,000 people is Adelaide over here. And that's 2,100 kilometers away. The 70% wow. of Australia in between the lights of cities is covered by the outback desert. Vast and inhospitable and near nearly empty of people, save for this small speck of light directly in the continent's center. This yep. is the town Thanks. of Alice.
I love this city so much. I've looked into videos on my own time. I just I just got an obsession with it. It's literally in the middle of nowhere and it just it kind of just seems like you're just in a different world. I've just watched videos about it and it just blows my mind. I don't know why. Maybe it is because it's just so deserted. I don't know if other people would feel the same about it, but it was mentioned in a video a few days ago and it's always been a city that I've just I've just been blown away by I'm not gonna lie. Alice Springs, population <laughs> of 26,000 people. And directly next to Alice Springs is Pine Gap, a joint oh, United States Australian intelligence base that is run by the CIA and the NSA with more than 800 employees. The reason why the CIA and the NSA have a base in the middle of the Australian outback is because Satellites. of its prime geographic significance. The base here controls and operates American spy satellites as they pass over this third of the globe, including China, North Korea, the Asian part of Russia, and the Middle East. Theoretically, the base that controls all of them could have been placed anywhere here, but the dead center of the Australian continent was chosen as the singular best location for it because it's thousands of kilometers away from the ocean in every direction, in the middle of nowhere, inside of a very friendly country, and as a result, the location location is simply far too remote and inland for enemy ships passing in international waters nearby to intercept any of the signals. And thus, that's why you have a lone, isolated spot. dot of light in the middle of a sea of darkness in Australia. Me Wait, so this city was made because of this? Um, Alice Springs. I, I've, I, I mean, it makes sense. Alice Springs... Okay, that's not what I want to say. When was Springs founded? That's probably not. Oh, 1872. So it was a city before, but then it became, I guess, more populated when this whole thing became. Oh, this whole satellite stuff came across. Or whatever. Meanwhile, the United States itself has a very light, interesting man. population pattern as well. Just this area, you know, it's obviously still a lot of lights compared to places like Russia, where it's just completely dim, or even these, these parts of Canada. But this area is so much more light. But then you say that, in terms of population, actually it probably is quite, because it's just mainly on the coast here, isn't it? And you've got New York, you've got flipping, what, Texas, you've got Texas cities, all highly populated, you've got Florida and stuff. Revealed by the presence, Maybe not. or in this case, the absence of lights. You'll notice that America is also. divided between two halves of roughly equal size. The east, a bastion of bright lights, and the west, an archipelago of bright islands scattered across a sea of darkness. And the line that separates the two sides flows almost perfectly straight just to the west of San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth, Oklahoma City, Wichita, Omaha, Sioux Falls, and Fargo. <clears throat> this line largely follows the 100th meridian line of longitude, and it still largely marks to this day in the 21st century the beginning of the American Western frontier, with few large settlements scattered to the west beyond it. The reason for why this pattern continues to exist is because Loads. the 100... The land is just completely different, isn't it? You've got deserts, you've got like mountain ranges, you've got, like, I guess, forest, forestry or whatever, I don't know. Maybe not that, but... Just the land is a lot harder to build on. Meridian roughly marks the geographic boundary between the wetter and more humid climate found in the east and the drier, more arid climate of the west. Moist air coming in from the Gulf of Mexico rarely travels any further to the west than this line, while at the same time, the gigantic Rocky Mountains chain casts a vast rain shadow across the landscape that prevents additional moisture from blowing in from the Pacific. And so, as a result, the agriculture in the west has always the been forced to rely much much more heavily upon irrigation technologies like and has always been less Probably efficient is. than is the it? farms in the east, which means less food and less people over the centuries of development. Geography often dictates where people end up go. settling down. This is going to answer my question. So I said Cairo's here and it goes down the Nile. I think I'm going to feel so stupid if I'm wrong. I'm going to be annoyed at myself because this is the dam, right? What is that dam called again? I can't remember. But... As in Egypt. Here at night, Come you can on. easily trace the course of the Nile River through the country yes. as the brilliant lights of Not Egyptian even. civilization trace its outline. Around 97 million people live within just a few kilometers of the Nile banks inside of Egypt, making it one of the most densely populated regions in the world and causing the entire river to be easily visible from space at night. A very similar pattern of lights can also be observed far away in Pakistan along the Indus River. 
Just like the Nile, the Indus has been a center of civilization for thousands of years, as people have farmed and tilled the river's rich and fertile floodplains. In spite of the yeah, arid conditions that make it difficult to grow food anywhere else in the rest of the region. Now, in the 21st century, the bright lights of Pakistan's modern cities make it easy to trace the river's course from space, as many of the country's biggest cities are clustered across it. While the Indus is an example of a clear geographic feature that humans have adapted around, this wavy line of lights directly nearby to the east is the exact opposite. This is actually the international border that divides Pakistan from India, an arbitrary line that was created by the British when they divided the two countries and granted them both independence more than 70 years ago. Without any- And thanks to that, we've caused a lot of unrest. The UK doing what it does best. There's a lot of stuff to do about like a lot of controversy, whatever, isn't there? Oh, the UK. The world would be such a better place without <laughs> mountains or rivers to mark the border during the day. Back then, this line only existed on papers, on maps, and within mines. But now, in the 21st century, it can be clearly seen from space and is very real. Because India and Pakistan are bitter geopolitical rivals who have fought four wars against each other in the past few decades, India, citing security reasons, opted to install thousands of kilometers of floodlights across the entire length of the border to keep it all well illuminated at night, which makes it perhaps oh, wow. the easiest and the most obvious artificial man-made creation to spot from space. Meanwhile, within India, it's really the change in lights over time that have been the most fascinating. Back in the year 2000, only about 60% of the Indian population had any access to electricity by 20. 60%? God, times really have changed. Thank God for that. 12, that number had increased to about 80%, but that still meant that 20% of India, or about 253 million people, still had no access to electricity. As a result, Bro. the nighttime map of India at the time looked a lot like this. But 2014 saw the election of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who ran on a campaign promise of bringing electricity to every village in India. Thus, by 2016, when NASA created the latest edition of the Black Marble photo, the lights across the country increased dramatically. The edition of the Black Marble photo, the lights across Actually, the country- I mean, here it did. I mean, it's, yeah, I guess it did. But for 250 million people, I thought it would be like everywhere. But I guess these areas just aren't as inhabited, so. But yeah, I guess a bit. Increased dramatically to look like this as more than 125 million Indians gained electricity for the very first time, and all in a span of only four short years. This Damn. became one of the greatest achievements ever made in the entire history of energy. And now in 2022, with nearly 100% of the population having access to electricity, India is among the brightest countries seen anywhere on the planet's surface. Immediately next. Not a surprise when India is the second most populated, but at least they got that sort of. That's pretty crazy that they managed to do that in such a short time. Time frame. Next door, China, with her population of more than 1.4 billion people, is also one of the brightest countries in the world. But the change in lights across China over the same time period tells a very different story than the one in India. If you take a look at the map of lights from 2012 and then fast forward to 2016, you'll notice nearly Jeez. everywhere a dimming of lights across the countryside and the intensification of brightness coming from the cities. For decades now, all across the world, people nearly everywhere have been moving from the countryside into the cities for better access to jobs, markets, education, and healthcare. But nowhere on the planet has this general trend been more acute than in China, where just since 1975, nearly half of the entire population, around 715 million people, have abandoned the Chinese countryside for the cities. Back in 1975, China was still overwhelmingly a rural and agrarian society with only 17.4% of the population residing within urban cities. But then, in the late 70s and the early 80s, the Chinese government began doing things differently. They created what they called special economic zones, and at first 18 cities along the coast, where the taxes were less and where there was less state oversight from the centralized oh, wow. communist government. So the taxes were less and there was just more opportunity. I mean, obviously there's always is more opportunities in the cities for jobs and stuff but the taxes being less that gives every person a reason to move to the cities no everyone wants to have less 
like to pay less for taxes and all that kind of stuff. Right. These zones attracted a lot of foreign businesses to set up their operations. And with the plentiful new jobs they provided, came in workers from the countryside. The very first of these zones was the town of Shenzhen, which at the time in 1980 was a relatively sleepy town of only 300,000 people. Today, only a little more than 40 years later, Shenzhen has exploded into a global tech hub metropolis of more than 13 million. Now, right. in 2022, China boasts more than 312 urban areas with populations of more than 500,000 people, most of which... In the UK, what, we probably have like 10? And that's probably it, over 500,000? Obviously, the populations are completely different like yeah it's just way different to china right way lower but still god damn it you've probably never even heard of for comparison the united states has only 96 of these large urban areas meaning that there are today vastly more urban chinese people living in cities than americans which was not at all the case back in 1975. the change in lights across china in the four years between 2012 and 2016 shows this greater historical right. trend very clearly in also maybe because they're trying to move people out of their cities and stuff i mean there's definitely some suspect things that this country's doing too but it's crazy how they've changed so much in these areas in such a short frame time just that short time frame more than 81 frame time, million time people frame. about the population of germany left the chinese countryside and moved into the cities the brightest of all these areas and the brightest single spot anywhere on the earth's surface Shanghai. is right here the pearl river delta a conglomeration of close by cities like hong kong shenzhen guangzhou and zhuhai that if considered oh. a single Four cities this close. I mean, it's China, so it's hard to judge how close they actually are, but... Damn. single urban metropolitan area would be the largest anywhere in the world with a population of about 70 million people in that other words insane. half of the population of russia all living together in a single small intensely bright metropolis more more than the population in the uk i'm pretty sure in this Oh my god. Ever since the year 1879, what? when the light bulb was first patented by Thomas Edison, the globe has been growing brighter and brighter with every passing year from space, as more and more of humanity has come online and gained access to electricity. Today, more than 90% of humanity has electricity, the highest figure that's ever been known. But at the same time, more than 759 million people worldwide still do not have any access to it. And more than 90% of those people live inside of one of the darkest regions seen anywhere on the planet still here, Sub-Saharan. It's so wild though, because you obviously got it so lit up here and then it just gets so dark just the further down you go. <clears throat> and it's quite lit up here as well. Jeez, there's probably more lights here than there is for the rest of this area. In what? Africa. There are some areas of intense brightness here, to be sure, like in the major cities like Lagos, South Nairobi, Africa, Johannesburg, yeah. and Cape Town. But by and large, Sub-Saharan Africa appears far darker than it should be. Not because it's empty, but because there are still 683 million people who live here without any access to electricity. The country of Burundi has the lowest overall percentage of people who have access to electricity anywhere in the world, at only 11% of the population. Meanwhile, the Democratic Republic oh of the days. Congo, or DRC, is the country with the highest overall number of people still remaining without electricity, 72 and a half million more than the population of France. These millions of people still use solid fuels like wood for heating and for light. And as a result, their presence is invisible to the light-seeking satellites of NASA and the areas they inhabit appear empty. And thus, the DRC in particular, and Sub-Saharan Africa in general, is the largest area in the inhabited world still remaining that, from the perspective of space, appears largely as it has for the past several millions of years. But just like how the absence of lights doesn't necessarily mean the absence of people, the presence of lights doesn't necessarily indicate their presence either. The North Sea is a large body of water around Europe, and as you're probably aware, oceans generally don't tend to have a lot of people. But when you focus over the sea at night, you'll- What? So these are like oil rigs, right? My sister's, my older sister's boyfriend goes to work, so Hull. Hull's like, here, I'm pretty sure. Somewhere down here. 
maybe this little area here and he goes so he, he lives around here but he comes here and then he goes off i guess to these like oil rigs here but these are so much more lit up what the hell why in the north sea that i guess the north sea is just juice of oil or something like what you'll notice dozens of little lights sprinkled across the surface rather than representing human <laughs> settlements these lights betray the presence of the roughly 170 offshore oil and gas rigs 170 what god damn it is lit up here what the hell that are operated in the sea by norway the uk and the netherlands oil and gas wells emit a lot of light because as they drill they flare gas when you have a lot of gas flaring going on in a concentrated area their presence is revealed at night from the sky and using this as a guide you can clearly see where the world's most important sources of oil and gas can be found Besides for the sites in the North Sea, you can see lights in the eastern Mediterranean off the coasts of Egypt and Israel, representing the offshore gas rigs that are operated by both countries. You can see an extensive chain of lights across the Caspian Sea, flowing out from the capital city of Azerbaijan, Baku, where the very first offshore oil platforms in the world were originally constructed. And of course, the area around the Persian Gulf appears bright enough oh, to almost days. be its own galaxy, owing to the extensive oil and gas fields across Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. The waters of the Persian Gulf itself are spectacularly lit up, with more than 145 offshore rigs, including the ones around here. The North Field split between Qatar and Iran, which is by far the single largest natural gas field ever discovered anywhere on the planet. No wonder why these countries are getting breaded up then. It makes sense. Okay. Lights tell stories every. Wait, have you just clocked yet? Yeah? Okay, maybe not. I was going to say these these oil rigs are more lit up than like Qatar and these places here, but these are very lit up. So maybe Ever not. discovered anywhere on the planet? Lights tell stories everywhere you see them, but the absence of lights can tell just as strong of a tale. For another notable area, we have to travel back across Asia to the Korean Peninsula, where the difference in lights between North... Bro, oh my days, look at the difference here. That's, it shouldn't really be a surprise because North Korea is just known for like not being the wealthiest and all these things. But god damn. Also, what's the lighting here? Because isn't this off land? Hopefully he explains that. North and South is as great as the difference between night and day itself. Save for the capital of Pyongyang, North Korea is almost entirely dark, despite having a population of nearly 26 million people. The border in the north with China can be clearly seen by the zigzagged patterns of bright Chinese cities over on the other side of it. At the very same time, the southern border with South Korea can be clearly seen lit up in its entirety from space as well. This is the most heavily militarized border anywhere in the entire world that artificially cuts the Korean peninsula in half and divides the democratic regime in the south from the totalitarian regime in the north, guarded by millions of soldiers and landmines on either side. As a result, the entire border is basically a gigantic fortress that is completely covered by floodlights at night, cementing the old, arbitrary ceasefire line that ended the Korean War back in 1953 as a permanent and clearly visible man-made feature when viewing the world from above at night, as if it were instead a major natural geographic feature. And right across that border to the south is Seoul, the largest and brightest city in South Korea with more than 25 million million inhabitants look how lit up south korea is as a whole all the coast down here is just lit up and then you've got the major cities but even where it's not the major cities it still looks quite bright in general i know it's quite a highly populated country and you can tell by this sorry for my chair it's so loud i can't wait to get a new one um, but i'm still confused what this is is it just oil rigs again it's not he would have explained it is it just boats ship shipping and stuff i don't know because the land ends here, I thought. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it goes around here. I'm confused. Almost as many people as live in the entirety of North Korea combined. South Korea's tremendously bright lights are indicative of the modern, developed, and prosperous nation that is the world's eighth largest consumer of electricity. Meanwhile, the darkness of North Korea is indicative of the inefficient, totalitarian, fascist state that only has an electricity rate of 48.5% of their population, meaning that more than 13 million North Koreans continue having no access to power. North 
North and South Korea's man-made political shapes are therefore both clearly visible from space. And this view puts into perspective the more practical reality that South Korea is effectively, despite being connected by land to the rest of Asia, an island surrounded by darkness on yeah. all four sides as every other island in the world is. But the most startling change in light seen anywhere in the world over the past few years has been back over on the other side of Asia, within the Middle East. In the past decade, three countries in the Middle East. Yeah, it must have changed so much now because of the oil and all the stuff. These countries have been getting rich, rich. So, I mean, I can't imagine what it would look like 40 years ago. Hopefully he shows it. I think he will. But it's gonna. Be, this is really probably going to be the biggest change over the time. At have undergone devastating civil wars that have claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands oh. of people. Okay, he's talking about, um, where is it? Where's, where's the civil war going on? Like, I'm thinking of Somalia, but that's like here. Amman, I think? Yemen, Iraq, and Syria. And in the time yeah. between 2012 and 2016, when the two black marble photos were compiled, much has changed. In Yemen, the lights have gone out across conflict zones since the civil war began in 2014, and after nearly 400,000 deaths. In Iraq, ISIS has been long since defeated, but from 2012 to 2016, you can clearly see the lights fading to darkness in all of the areas that they captured and occupied. And then, Worst of all, there are the effects of war that can be clearly seen from space above Syria. As the flipping hell, that is insane! Literally all along the river, it's just gone. civil war in the country intensified, and the catastrophic destruction began growing greater. As much as 80% of the lights in the country went out in just the four years between 2012 and 2016. The most significant changes of all came around the city of Aleppo, the largest city inside of Syria and one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. As the four years between 2012 and 2016 went by, the lights across the city went out. And that tells us a very, Completely. very grim story. For in those four years, one of the most important, devastating, brutal, and catastrophic battles of the entire 21st century was fought. As Syrian government and Syrian rebel armies clashed, the city was put under siege, and the war of attrition that followed resembled the Battle of Stalingrad from the Second World War. Both sides deployed chemical weapons within the city against the other. The Syrian government committed indiscriminate attacks using devastatingly destructive barrel bombs. The Russian Air Force got involved with their own airstrikes, and rampant war crimes were committed almost continuously. After four years of fighting, the horrific battle that took place here transformed into one of the longest sieges in modern warfare, and one of the bloodiest battles of the 21st century, with tens of thousands of lives that were lost, with an overwhelming amount of them being civilians, and tens of thousands of buildings right. that were destroyed and along. Then, and then you'll get people who, like will be like, why, uh, not why, I don't know how to explain it, but like, there's refugees, right? They'll be like, why are they going to my country, all this kind of stuff? Oh my God, they drive me insane. People going through this stuff, it's stuff, it's stuff that people like, from the UK or from countries that are lucky and don't have to experience this kind of stuff, couldn't imagine. We just couldn't imagine it. And you just like, get people who are just so insensitive to stuff like this, when you actually realise what's going on. And this is just... 0.1% of like the actual reality of what pe these people have went through and what people go through like this Look at this man. The whole city is just into dust. It's just destroyed Like flipping out and people's lives just taken for, for nothing. It's just fucking ridiculous And again people try and escape to be safe and then you'll just get oh you just get idiots who are just like oh why are they why they can't stop coming to my country or just all this sort of shit just shut up man just honestly shut your mouth alongside them aleppo is the city that has been most destroyed by warfare bro literally the whole city flipping hell in the 21st century and it will never <coughs> again be the same as it was before without a doubt the battle of aleppo is one of the most critical and fascinating battles of the 21st century to understand but unfortunately if i made a video about it on youtube there's no way that it would ever get monetized and there's probably no way that you would ever see it 
So instead, I created yet another full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that's about the same length as this video that covers the entire story of Aleppo and Syria's Stalingrad from beginning to end, and uploaded it directly to Nebula, which, as you've probably Oh damn, he posts videos in another channel. He's getting his ad in, you'd love to see it, he's... I, say, I keep saying he, I guess it's a group of people who make these videos. But um, yeah, another very interesting video that I've watched. And I mean, yeah, hopefully you enjoy this one. Again, I learned a lot to be fair, even for me, I, I don't look at news that much. I obviously know things that happen and stuff, but I try not to look at the news because I just don't... I get most of my stuff from like Twitter because I just think it's just one of those places where you don't get... I mean, you still probably get biased media and stuff, but it's just like... I don't know, you just get the real stuff and like people share real things that happen in places like China and just stuff like that where you won't get it on the real news or just stuff like that, I don't know. But yeah, um, it's an interesting reaction and yeah, I did learn quite a lot. And I mean, if you want more reactions to this channel, let me know in the comments. And yeah, until next time, like, subscribe and peace.